As you know, the autonomic nervous system comes in two components, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. At high school, you probably learnt that the sympathetic was the flight or fright response. Basically, it's the system that responds to uh, pressures in the environment for an organism. The parasympathetic system is the inverse. It's the system that keeps the basic functions operating at a basal level. The driving central nervous system nuclei for the autonomic nervous system lie in the limbic system. And the limbic system is the oldest part of the brain at its core. So the limbic system sits within the core of the brain. Uh, from the limbic system, various outputs then exit to uh, From the limbic system, various outputs exit the central nervous system to actually undertake or to drive the functions of the autonomic nervous system. And as we said, there are outputs for parasympathetic, which come out with the cranial nerves. And down in the sacral region as well. And there are outputs for the sympathetic nervous system that fundamentally come off from the region of the thorax. So the sympathetic come off from the thorax, whereas the parasympathetic come off with some cranial nerves and with some of the sacral nerve. And these outputs, just to tell you which cranial nerves they come off with, it is cranial nerve 3, 7, 9, and our old friend 10. And in fact 10 is the largest parasympathetic nerve in the body and it migrates down through the neck through the thorax and through most of the abdomen and the lower sacral parasympathetic components run down towards the leg whereas the sympathetic come off and form a chain along the thorax region where it comes off the spinal cord and then spreads out up and down from there. Now I've drawn this on one side of the central nervous system remember it is symmetric so you would see it on both sides now it's important also to note that uh, the ganglia or the first synapse of these systems is different for sympathetic than parasympathetic. The sympathetic have its ganglia where first order neuron synapses with second order neuron very close to where it comes off the spinal cord and this is in fact called the sympathetic chain and runs down adjacent to the vertebra through the body. Whereas on the other side, the parasympathetic have its ganglia sitting very close. Again, there are synapses in this ganglia, so it's from first order to second order. They sit very close to where the actual uh, action of the parasympathetic fibres is to take place. All of these ganglia has, have as neurotransmitters acetylcholine and the difference between parasympathetic ganglia and sympathetic ganglia there are no differences they both are acetylcholine. The differences between the system are at the end point neurotransmitter which for parasympathetic is acetylcholine, whereas for the sympathetic system, the end point is, is noradrenaline. And that, um, that is some of the differentiation between the two systems. 
So this is the introductory summary to the autonomic nervous system. The core computational activity is in within the limbic system. It gets its input or sensory component to drive these changes from the sensory system that we've talked about elsewhere. The output of the limbic system is either parasympathetic output through cranial nerves 3, 7, 9 and 10 or uh, sacral fibres or sympathetic output that comes out with the thoracic spinal nerves. Alright, let's now take a closer look at the parasympathetic output with the cranial nerves. As we said, cranial nerves 3, 7, 9 and 10 have a parasympathetic output. We can simply conclude for cranial nerve 10 that this runs to the body. Well, it's technically not true. It doesn't run to the lower limbs and uh, the lower sort of third of the, of the uh, abdomen, but it basically runs to all of the rest, including heart, lungs, uh, gut, liver, you know, the entire body. Similarly, with the third cranial nerve, we can simply say that this runs into the orbit, and in fact it ends up in the eye and takes responsibility for functions such as the, uh, the uh, dilation of your pupil and those sorts of parasympathetic functions. Remember, as we said in the summary, the ganglia for parasympathetic sit very close to the activity. Now this third cranial nerve ganglia is called the ciliary ganglia. And the ciliary ganglia has synapses in it. And remember that the uh, neurotransmitter in these ganglia will be acetylcholine. The interesting part becomes the seventh and ninth cranial nerves parasympathetic output. And the story is really a story of uh, a problem. The fifth cranial nerve basically supplies the, uh, the face. And the face, in, th in three parts, remember it supplies the ophthalmic division, division one, division two, and division three. which make up the fifth cranial nerve to supply the face. And these components supply areas where there is lots of glands and a, a high and nasal mucosa and a lot of high demand for uh, parasympathetic fibres. Um, but the fifth cranial nerve got no parasympathetic component. So what happens is fibres from the seventh and ninth cranial nerve cross over and join with the fifth to supply these structures. So really what we're doing now is we're going to take a little bit of say the seventh nerve and plug it in to these other cranial nerves to supply various parts of the, various parts of the face that the fifth nerve supplies. For example, let's take the first part of this journey a small part of the seventh nerve comes off, heads and joins in with the very lowest parts of the mandibular division of trigeminal nerve and it forms the submandibular ganglion. And that those fibres run with the lingual part of this third division run with the lingual nerve 
to supply the glands in the floor of the mouth and associated areas. So this little piece of the seventh nerve that comes off is called the corda tympani. An interesting name. It actually gets its name because when you look into someone's ear you can see a cord running across the tympanic membrane and that's it on its journey from the seventh nerve to then end up joining in with the lower part of the fifth nerve. Similarly, another part of the seventh nerve comes off, runs along and joins the second division of the trigeminal nerve to distribute off with that. The ganglia in that case is called the sphenopalatine ganglia and it sits in the pterygopalatine fossa. And this little piece of seven that has jumped off to join with the maxillary division of trigeminal is called the greater superficial petrosal nerve. Really, it's just a piece of the parasympathetic component of seven that has come off to join the second division of the fifth nerve to distribute off to supply glands in the in the nasal cavity and the palate and all of those sorts of regions that the second division of trigeminal distributes to. And the last part of this story is the small piece of the ninth nerve that comes off and distributes with another part, the higher part of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve and that's called the auriculotemporal nerve. And this has a little ganglia as well, that we've all heard of. That ganglia is called the otic ganglia. The otic ganglia sits just outside the mandibular foramen. And this little piece of ninth is called the lesser superficial petrosal nerve. Now, the first thing you notice is the greater and the lesser superficial petrosal nerve the names are very similar. That's because they both run across the petreous temporal bone. The difference is the greater is a bit of parasympathetic output coming from seven, where the lesser is a little bit of parasympathetic output coming from nine. The greater going off to join the maxillary division of trigeminal, whereas the lesser is going off to join the auricular temporal part of the mandibular division of fifth cranial nerve. So this is the story of the parasympathetic output of the cranial nerves. A little bit of a complication because it could have all been solved if the fifth cranial nerve had its own parasympathetic output. But since it didn't, it had to borrow fibres from 7 and 9 to supply the glandular structures of the nasal cavity and the salivary glands, submandibular, sublingual and parotid, as well as the lacrimal gland, to produce the saliva and nasal secretions essential for good health.